My name is Ann Halke and I'm with the Department of Human Services with the City and the Faith-Based Initiative and I'm going to pass this over to our uh, local host for a word of welcome. Thank you, Ann, and thank you all for being here at your San Antonio Food Bank. My name is Eric Cooper. I'm the President and CEO here, and um, we're just so excited to, to host this conversation and are seeing a lot of folks, uh, friendly faces, partners uh, in the audience, and so uh, excited to be here. If this is your first time uh, to your San Antonio Food Bank, we'd ask that you return. Uh, we've got lots going on. And, uh, would love to engage you fully in different strategies around meeting basic needs of our residents throughout uh, the community. But welcome. I'm going to hand the microphone back to Ann, and we're going to get this party started. Thanks. The uh, Eric just said to me, "We have officially come as unprepared as you asked us to." So this is a conversation. Um, it's not like a panel discussion. It's really a, a conversation. And um, they will be starting the conversation. There are going to be three questions that we're all going to be looking at. And so they'll get a question, and they're going to talk for a while. And then we're going to move out, and you're going to continue that conversation among yourselves. And then we're going to come back for a second question, and we repeat that process three times. Okay. Um, we are also recording this through Nowcast SA. If anyone here is not comfortable with that, um, you should let Charlotte Ann know she's going to wave her arm like this to let her know so she'll kind of steer away from you. But we want to make sure that we record and pull to and harvest kind of the wisdom and the things that are happening that are in the room. We don't want to miss any of that. We'll also put it up online in case you want to go back to your organization or congregation and be able to show that as well. So it should be a good resource for you. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to quickly introduce our conversation starters. And so Eric has already said howdy. And Mike Flores, he's going to wave his hand, but he's the chancellor at Alamo Colleges. And he brings a conversation, at, of course, with education and skills, which go back to um, Eric's conversation at direct programs and services. I'm going to be asking you to think about what your add to the conversation is, your vantage point. Brenda Mascara, she's going to make her hand. She's the executive director of SARA, the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless. Always going to work on her conversation at collaboration and support services. Ricardo Ramirez, he's going to wave his hand. He's with Workforce Solutions, the director of analytics, performance, and strategy. I'm sorry, he sounds really important. <laughs> uh, his conversation at job opportunities and success. And then the person that I report to, Melody Wolseley, who's the director of the Department of Human Services, and her ad are Human Services and Local Government, which I am still trying to figure out. But I'm grateful to her for doing that. So um, we're going to start with our first converse, our first question, which is, so this is to our conversation starters. From your vantage point, why? is opening this conversation about shortening the line so important. And if you have a story or some kind of stat to validate why you think it's important. But you know that whole thing of bread line, soup line, food line, clothing line, line line, everyone's in line. Uh, not as my more like feral cats most of the time. But um, those are the lines that we're talking about. And Eric and I were in a conversation probably two months ago, which was before the migrant influx. And he raised the question about, we made a statement actually, we need to have the conversation about shortening the line. And so I'm going to lobby it to him first because he kind of started the conversation a couple months ago. And then I'm going to yeah, so I think, you know, in the San Antonio community, this is the 40 years that we've been in existence providing food to partner organizations throughout South Texas. We, we tend to think about that feed the line strategy. And, you know, we've got an opportunity, whether it's through a food pantry, providing groceries, or through, uh, you know, our 
corporation uh, on Sonic PD. Um, but you know, probably more than a decade ago, started to really pivot uh, to dual strategy and not just be in line or short in line. And you know, what that conversation has been to us has been um, really talking more about workforce development, um, meaningful jobs, uh, sustainable wages. We know that we're not going to solve the rule that we can't do it. Um, it has to be a long holistic approach. And, and so, um, that dual strategy, uh, we think it's critical. Um, I always think of that parable of uh, kind of give a man a fish, uh, um, you know, for a day, but teach him how to fish for a lifetime. And oftentimes, I think when people say that, they, they think that uh, teaching is the more noble pursuit. Like that's, that's really where you want to put your energy in. Less than the fish, but uh, I'll quickly correct and say um, it has to be tandem. You have to, you have to do both. If, uh, if you don't pack it to a sandwich, she won't eat you at the dock, right? Uh, she can't her babies are hungry, and she, she eats, and her kids need nourishment. So, how do you stabilize that household while helping uh, that individual move towards? So I think that's, that's the work of short people in mind. Is, is, uh, we know that's a need to nourish, but uh, what can we be doing to also um, help families move towards self sufficiency and self awareness? So I think um, it's um, we don't know. I know folks say we know what we know. Well, I think it's what we don't know, we don't know. And so uh, when it comes to our own personal missions and our organizations, and I'm supposed to be looking at you, that's, that, um, and you're supposed to look at each other. <laughs> but it's a habit to look at, this, at the crowd. Um, but when we have those conversations with, individual, with other agencies, um, we start learning about things we don't know. Um, oftentimes, we get so zoned in on what our board told is, what our mission is, what we are trying to accomplish, and we start looking at things and we start looking down to try to accomplish because a lot of us are aggressive. A lot of um, organizations want, are goal oriented and we want to um, accomplish what we said we were going to accomplish. And you know, goal and mission is very important. However, if we don't look up and see what other um, individuals are working on around us, we can totally miss the boat. Um, and when I say that is we can be reinventing wheels. We can have individuals working on things in a much more effective, better way that we haven't really um, paid attention and we don't know about. And then we sit in a circle like this and say, oh, so-and-so already did that in that organization over there. Or, that, oh, they're working on that as well. Um, have you guys worked together? Um, so I think that we need to look up um, from what we are doing uh, because everything is intercorrelated when, when it has to do with shortening that line. We have a very long line right now in our coordinated entry system. And for you all that don't know, um, Sarah, the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless, we don't provide any direct services. We are um, we do the research, we do the data collection, we do uh, the systemic work. We try to do the um, strategic planning around homelessness for Bear County and San Antonio. Um, but with that said, if we um, Again, don't look up. We, we miss what all that, uh, how everybody can work together to really try to shorten that list. We have a very long coordinated entry list, and coordinated entry essentially means that the folks come into um, the homeless system. And if uh, that list is incredibly long, and it's almost inhumane to put people on a list that's not going to shorten. And um, we need to figure out how, instead of putting them on this list, um, help working with each other to see how we can divert, how we can um, help individuals um, from being homeless and, and help them um, in ways where the rest of the community can help us um, and not just be placed on a list, be placed on a list, on, and, or in this case, in the line. So I would, um, so we just uh, last night wrapped up our fifth graduation ceremony from our five colleges. So we began uh, last Friday with uh, St. Philip's College and then last night ended with uh, Palo Alto College. We will have over 
11,000 students graduate by the end of the summer uh, for the year, which is uh, close to a record number of students. Uh, that's the majority of our students now. If you come to one of our five colleges, you have a, a likelihood that you're going to graduate or transfer. So the majority, 50% of our students graduate or transfer the rest of the courses and then go on to achieve the, their next goal in life. Um, but we should have more students graduate. We should actually have more students enroll. So I would like to uh, proper that we should have more students in line. Um, and let me tell you why I say that. Um, in 2012, we actually had 50% of our high school graduates in Bear County go to a college or university. It doesn't, didn't have to be one of the Alma colleges. It could be UTSA, it could be St. Mary's, it could be any one of our public or private universities. Um, in the city or even the state. So 50% in 2012 went to college. Right now it's 45%. So the line's gotten shorter. Um, so less students are availing themselves of the opportunity to go to college or university. And the reason um, that the line is not longer for us is because uh, what we talk about is our students actually we don't compete from the Alamo Colleges. We don't compete with UTSA or a and San Antonio. We compete with poverty. Our students make a choice between going to school and seeing if they can afford it, and they weigh opportunity costs and determine how many hours less that will mean in work, how much less they'll contribute to their household budget to assist oftentimes their mom, to see if they can uh, work less hours and offer less support to their parents, if what implications that has for supporting their children. And so for us, I think the importance is how can we assist more students to cross that stage with a credential and then go all the way to, in particular, just there are many subgroups, but looking at one subgroup, of when students cross the stage from high school graduation, can we support them with enough services to determine that they would like to go to school and that they feel they have this community behind them to be able to avail themselves of that opportunity? You know, I think it's interesting kind of think of this thought of a line that you know each organization that's here probably has a line and one way that your line might be shortened is evaluating capacity in other lines right so it might be just shifting it um, for us there's so much around federal benefits in our community uh, programs like SNAP, WIC, CHIP, Medicaid, TAN and long-term care those programs oftentimes um, have capacity in their mind, right? And so uh, individuals within our community just don't know maybe how to get in that line. Um, Texas as a whole has about 40% of, of our residents that qualify to be in that line can't find it, right? So uh, being a navigator to those lines with capacity um, can help shorten your line but ultimately bring some stabilization that then can move someone to never be in one of our lines. And I think to add to that, um, you know, what, what's so important to us about having this conversation is despite having what we perceive to be vast resources, we're not serving uh, really even uh, the majority of the people who need the services. And so I think uh, we work with Workforce Solutions Alamo to provide child care subsidies um, to the community and we're going to spend almost 70 million dollars this year doing that and still have a wait list and still have families who need child care so they can work um, so you know i think as from the local government perspective we cannot uh, impact this alone so you know, we're a two and a half billion dollar corporation but we need the collaboration is so important it's the only thing that's effective is that we're all working Together. And so this is a great start to that. And, and that's really um, why the Human Services Department exists, is to uh, 
to help facilitate those collaborations, convene, um, and participate in them, and uh, bring local government perspective. I think government has um, the opportunity, you know, at all levels, local, state, and federal, to um, make great impact on communities, of course, but the government also has the ability to harm. And that's the other reason it's so important for us to be part of this conversation. And I think a good example, and I know um, Haven for Hope is here and, and will understand, and Sarah, um, you know, a good good portion of the people that are homeless have either been in the foster care system, um, which is a state-run system, or in the military. Um, and so, so government has to be at the table and part of the conversation so as not to create more, more issues, I think. Um, yeah, I think that this conversation is uh, real. I think it needs to, to happen. It seems like there's many lines where those who need different, uh, the people have different needs. And so they have a line for Alamo Colleges, they have a line for the Food Bank, they have a line for each of our different agencies. And we are just like a handful of those agencies uh, in, the, in the region. Um, and so we need to have that conversation uh, because I guess to that point, how do we tackle each of those lines and we don't come together in some way to, to formulate, um, prioritize, uh, leverage resources and work together, then by, you know, 2030, we're going to have by, uh, about 700,000 more people, um, we're going to have uh, the, the challenges that we have today will grow. And so how do we tackle those now? And it's only through those conversations. But making decisions, we need decision-making bodies that can agree on certain things. Um, we serve all populations. We serve children. We serve veterans. We serve youth. We serve adults. And each one of those has their own challenges, so their challenges are our challenges. How, how do we uh, put ourselves on uh, their shoes so that we can understand better their needs, and how do we serve them better? And the only way to do that is by working uh, together.
the stats. And so if you have an example, a story, or stat to give in that, that would be really helpful as well. There's paper at your table. You can rip off copies if you need something to write on and take notes. So you free to do that. Um, so we're going to have about 10 minutes to do that. I'll let you know when you have about two minutes to close up. So among three people, that's about three minutes each. Thanks. So if we can all kind of recollect to the next uh, question and next movement of our conversation while Mario brings up water. <laughs> um, before we forget, I already did once, but I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, it's really exciting, and if you can see the diversity, even of the organizations and congregations that we have in the room, it's really exciting. And I don't know, Mel and Eric, if you can remember, but it's almost exactly two years ago that we met in the same room at the beginning of the Faith-Based Initiative, and our conversation that day was on building and creating a resilient community. And how we've been doing that is through networking, intentional networking and partnerships between faith-based organizations, nonprofits, congregations, governmental agencies, and institutions. So we've been working on that for two years. And it was also in one of those election runoff times <laughs> um, two years ago. And that led us to, I put something on your table, of, and it's part of our next question. Uh, but the first resolution <clears throat> that was signed by our current council um, was the Charter for Compassion. That San Antonio joined 100 cities around the planet in being compassionate cities. That number has now grown to 450 cities around the planet who are working basically from the premise of the Golden Rule to treat and feed others to reach out to others in the way we wish to be treated fed, and reach out to as well. So the reason I bring this up, because for our next question, that compassion component is really important. If you look at the inside of the front cover, you will see the actual resolves from that resolution, the steps. And number four points to why we're gathering in this room. Those resolutions are about education and celebrating the acts of compassion. But basically, number four, let me make sure I get the right, yes, talks about that this isn't a city, official city run thing. It's, it's this compassion happens in community and working together. So, our next question. While well, continuing to stay compassionate, what needs to happen as a system to change? What needs to happen in the larger picture in terms of change while remaining compassionate? And if there are examples of something that's already happening that might be contributing to a good change and a good movement, maybe share that, or something in particular that still needs to happen. That would be good information. So I can turn it all to you. So it's interesting. I mean, working in this space for 25 years um, and working with a lot of great educational institutions, um, the growth in students wanting to get into the nonprofit sector comes with a lot of pain to me because it's this thought that, like, Hey, could we um, could we shrink this sector? Could we could we actually start to solve these problems so that we're in less demand? Um, and so again, it's this this thought about you know, uh, do I need more canned goods or do I need CEOs of conscience? Right? If if I have um, a student, uh, you know, if if I can shape them in their pursuit of an MBA uh, to have a greater sense of, of corporate responsibility uh, to the community and their employees that they would never imagine the food bank being a part of their benefits package to their employees, right? That, that they want to make sure that the wage that they're paying their employees is sustainable and meaningful um, so that they don't need the food 
if I could have more CEOs of conscience, um, that goes farther than getting another student with a degree in social work to help me, you know, feed the line. One of the things we were talking about where you all were um, having your discussions was technology and how uh, you know, maybe maybe one of the things that, that needs to happen, or, or one of the things that absolutely needs to happen, is the ability to um, look at, be client focused, and look at a client across systems and across programs. So all of these resources that go into providing services um, and shortening the line, we don't know what's happening from one program to the next and how the client is doing. A lot of times funding is for a year or two, and then we stop. Um, tracking that particular outcome. And so we don't know what's working and, and how do we create a system where we can look at what's happening to families and clients um, as they move forward and, and know for sure that they're getting the right service, the right time, um, absolutely the right level of service that they need to, to make an impact and, and the right quality. It, right now we, um, we really struggle to do that. And I think part of that, uh, part of the compassion of that is using a system like that to make decisions and to stop doing what isn't effective and isn't working or isn't efficient and focusing on the things that we know will make a difference. And um, that may not seem compassionate if it, if it impacts your funding or, or your, um, your staff, but um, as far as shortening the lines, the most compassionate thing I think we could do. Um, I think that, you know, in order for people to be compassionate, they need to know a little bit about what's going on as well. So I think it's getting the right people to the table. Uh, a lot of, I've been in meetings where, you know, it, you know it's not a downtown problem, it's not a this problem, it's not a that problem, you know, because people just don't know, a, a lot of folks just don't know um, about the need. Folks do know, many folks know, but there's a general public out there that's not aware of how great things can get and how great things are right now. Um, so I think getting people to the table, and as far as an example, the continuum of care, then, Sarah, um, we have only been around for three years, but I think it's a good start because if you look at our board of directors, we have a representative of the city of San Antonio, we have a representative of Bear County, we have a membership, a non-voting membership council and chairs. We have, um, we have a, the uh, sheriff uh, is on the board. Chief McManus is on the board. Um, and if one of them can't make it, they always send uh, their second command to the meetings. Uh, the fact that you know, we have also USA and New Star and, and so on and so forth, forth on the board is important. But we also just need to have those broader conversations with more people and really educate them on what's going on because the reality is folks in here care, but a lot of folks out there just don't think it's their obligation or their business to, to, to care. And so I think the what is that what needs to happen is, you know, we need to really focus on that general public and, and, and I know that we do it every day, but really continue to have people at the table because sometimes if they own it, if they're part of something, if they're part of you know a change, then you know once they own it, they work harder towards um, to, towards helping the mission. Um, and and then the other piece is just uh, looking at things. You know, you talked about technology. Looking at things not from um, you know the technology in the HMIS in the homeless arena or the technology that other banks or whatever or whatever organizational technology you're using, but looking at what other technologies exist that may work, um, because there's levels of expertise in other areas. Um, we were just talking about how you, the um, curbside at HB and so on and so forth, looking at those things are very important. Um, looking at what other industries are doing and not just looking at what our individual industries are using. So I think for me, coming from the educational perspective, the primary what is to look at leveraging those systems, those resources, those models that are already in place. And I'll give you two examples, one that has been effective and one that is emerging. So the first model, first comprehensive system is the early college high school model. 
So Gallimore College's district has over 10 early college high schools in partnership with our area ISDs and charter schools. And what we've seen with that model is that these students are students who not only would not have ever attended college, but they were in danger of completing high school altogether. So these are, are students who would not have completed high school and would have never dreamed of going, not going to college. And what we're seeing, as Dr. Flores mentioned last night in our graduation ceremony at Palo Alto College and at our sister schools, is that we have almost 200 early college high school students walk the stage and receive their associate's degree before they even receive their high school diploma. And so when you talk about system changes, that is a tremendous, tremendous win. And in one of our partner high schools, we found that all but one, all but one of their graduating seniors left with either an associate's degree or a college level in math, reading, and writing. And when you look at our entering freshmen, 70% of those students are not ready for college level material. But our early college high school students are leaving college ready. And whether they have you know, college courses or the associate's degree to leave college ready, that is a win. That is a system that's serving these students. And so that is a system that's effective. In terms of a system that's emerging and new, we have our Alamo Promise program. And that program provides free college for the first two years for students. And that program is set to launch next fall. And we have a lot of students who are going to qualify for federal aid that will help cover the expenses of tuition and fees. But there's students who are right on the bubble right on the brink, who aren't going to qualify for that federal aid, but are going to need support. And the Alamo <coughs> College is partnering with the city and partnering with the county. And people need those you know, investment dollars um, and support for that particular program. And again, when we talk about the systems there, the investment um, is, a, is a piece that's needed. And when we talk about revolutionary change and trying to shorten the lines and remove the lines, we know that education is at the crux of that. It's at the center of that. And programs like Promise and like Early College High School, they take away all those barriers to bring students into school. I think the second piece that, that needs to happen in terms of the system and in terms of being compassionate is that we have to be courageous and we have to be courageous to fail, uh, to Melody's point, and be courageous to say this isn't working and we can no longer offer it. And so the Alamo Colleges several years ago stepped into this space of meeting the basic needs of our students that they were struggling with outside of the classroom. I mean, educational institutions, their focus is teaching and learning. That's, that's the core service delivery model is teaching and learning within the classroom. And so several years ago, we said, no, they're not even making it to class because they don't have transportation. They don't have childcare. They're hungry, so they can't even focus when they are here. And we have a responsibility to our students and our community to try to help them overcome those barriers so that they can come to class, they can stay in school, they can make it to the next semester, and they can complete that credential. Because without that credential and a living wage, then what you what does this all mean in the end? And so we partnered with San Antonio Food Bank, we partnered with Goodwill, we partnered with communities and schools, we went to experts in this space, and we tried something that had never been done before, not only for the Alamo Colleges, but nationally. And we found that our students who are accessing these services they're doing better. They're staying in school. They have higher grade point averages, and they're moving towards completing those credentials. And that's what being courageous looks like. But it has to be the system kind of taking on that mindset and being afraid to fail and being afraid to let go of things that aren't effective. I um, that's fabulous. <laughs> that's great, great work. Um, you have to go outside of your space, um, and that's often. Uh, quite challenging and scary and risky and you're going to fail many times. Um, I'm so proud of our city that has taken this uh, uh, compassion as part of the resolution. Um, and if, I'm not sure if, they, if the city defined compassion or how does the city define compassion. One way would be uh, wishing well for others or wishing for them to be happy Alright, and uh, but it also involves action, doing the things that will make that person or individual be well. So it, um, 
it kind of like requires intention, meaning that where we want to go, it has to be intentional. And the, the policies that we set in place have to be intentional. Where we are now didn't happen just by random chance. You know? There's policies that we've set in place. There's things that are structural in nature that bring us to where we are right now. Uh, one of our challenges when we were developing the target occupation list, and that's a, a list of the in-demand occupations and industries that show the most promise for uh, the region and for which we pay training for. Uh, one of those challenges involves industries that can be very vocal and that have a huge role in the region, but that the wages may not be those that will not leave them hungry at the table when they work. And so we, we recognize the importance of those industries because they do bring a lot of money to the region and they do bring a lot of jobs, but they don't necessarily uh, um, look after the workers. I, let me rewind that. <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, they don't necessarily the, 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 the income that these, that these industries bring don't necessarily um, get distributed, distributed across the table. And so, um, but we at the same time have to recognize their importance. So we included some of those occupations in our target list. I, in speaking to some of the representatives myself, I said, okay, you know, I'm willing to, to do this, but I'm going to ask something back from you. And that would be that you would be a, a spokesperson and an advocate for wages because your median wages don't meet our standards that you would be an advocate in your industry so that the wages go up uh, to at least $15 an hour. And at that point, they committed to do that. But then I heard through other conversations that they, they didn't know necessarily how to do that. Um, there's many things that, I, I guess, they get in the way. And so how do we engage in those conversations that, um, that will actually make that bigger impact is very challenging. A lot of politics involved, a lot of uh, voices need to be at the table. Um, but they have to be uh, determined voices and intentional voices and this is the way that we're going and this is the way that, that it has to be if, if we are going to be compassionate. I would I would say again this is just being a little transparent and you know the, the food bank is an employer we have uh, you know, employees and I, I think you know we as organizations have to make sure that, that we're offering health care to our part-time employees we have to make sure that we're you know paying that living wage um, and and figure it out you know internally uh, before we take it externally and, and walk the walk ourselves if, if we're going to be successful. Thank you. So what I've heard here, um, kind of the summation of the role of the industries in terms of equity, advocacy, and becoming more compassionate and learning what that means. And to define that, Ricardo, uh, you use one of my favorite words, which is, as Matt will tell you, intentional. But within um, this resolution as a compassionate city, it is compassion in action. And, and that's what we look at. How are we working together for those, those compassionate outcomes? Um, to go outside our space, I heard that. Overcoming barriers through partnerships. Um, education is central to leverage models and systems that are already in place. Uh, looking at what other industries are doing focus on general public and being a part of something, getting uh, the right people to the table, stop doing what isn't effective or efficient, um, compassion isn't always nice, 
but it is always kind, and it does look for the greater good, and that's part of the definition as well. Um, technology and the role it plays and across the systems and programs, and the, the shaping of students pulls it back together, They're like that CEOs of conscience. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been watching as well, people who are bringing their better selves to the table, their conscience to the table, leading where they are with what they've got available, right? Um, so we're going to move then back out here into these circles as well. I want to apologize, though. I did not introduce Catherine. Uh, Mike had to leave, uh, but Catherine was here. She stepped in and continued the conversation, and she's also with Alamo Colleges. I know that some of you, that you know, two or three people, you know, that was a little difficult for you. If you want to talk as a table, please make sure everybody at the table gets a chance to talk. Right? Because that's what happens. So, uh, I still encourage two to threes. Still encourage. And my favorite riddle is, um, and somebody who doesn't know this, right, but uh, my favorite riddle is, what is the greatest nation on the planet? Rosalind knows. The imagination. The imagination. Because it has no boundaries, no barriers, no walls, no lines. And so with this second question, I encourage you to engage that nation within you and bring forth your, your best innovation as well. Okay? So while continuing to stay compassionate, what needs to happen as a system to change? And if you have examples, that would be great. About 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, if we could all come back together a bit. And we're coming in um, for the, you know, kind of the, the landing portion here. Our third question um, actually has two parts to it. Um, so back to that imagination and being as innovative as possible. How do we move forward to make this change happen? How, how do we do that? What might the steps be? The, but the two part to this is what action would you prioritize as a group that's talking and conversing? Would you prioritize as having the most potential? There's going to be a lot of steps, but trying to, to pick one that might leverage and be most strategic, that is a, a piece of wisdom. And it could be a simple thing. doesn't mean it won't be difficult to actually to do, but a simple thing. But, so that's a real challenge for this group as well, to talk in front of you of what those steps are and then to prioritize what do you think has the most benefit. It's kind of like a TED Talk, the real TED Talks. They decide which of those TED Talks has the most potential, which idea. So that's what you're coming in with now, okay? And I'm going to move over here this way. Ricardo always gets to go last. Yeah. I'm glad he got the hard one. Uh, I was still thinking about how to answer that question. Um, I guess I, the way that I would answer it would be how the how I was. I guess it would be the what for me first. Uh, I would look at where where could we have the largest impact. Uh, for us, it would be through the child care program, where we serve approximately eight thousand kids. Uh, if you look at a three-year period, we may serve about 10,000, 12,000 single parents, or mostly single parents, mostly single female parents who have one or two kids in their uh, mid to early 30s and who are working, so they're employed and, uh, or going to school. Uh, when I looked at some of that data and we try to see how many of them actually leave the program because their income increased just enough that they don't qualify anymore. Uh, and it was actually 1% of all of those uh, families who exited the program because they no longer qualified because they had a job that they made enough money to not qualify anymore. The other ones say child or there may be other reasons. Uh, I'm not putting down that the program at all. Please don't take it halfway. I think it's a fabulous program. It's 
so much. It helps families uh, to have affordable, quality ch child care uh, for the kids. It provides them with stable, uh, quality child, uh, child care, which is so important for our future generations. Uh, so it's a huge population who we serve. Uh, and what kind of impact could we have? And that's for the how, you know, how do we do that? Well, of course, it would be the closest partners that we have would be with the city. Then it would be, you know, those who may touch those groups the most. And it could be the food bank. It could be the San Antonio Housing Authority for those who are being trained. It could be Alamo Colleges for those who have, uh, depending on the issues that they have, working with those, finding out who those groups are, and then bringing them at the table and seeing how we could have a greater, greater impact on, a, on these families. How do, is it credentials that they need that maybe in one year, we may be paying for childcare for three years, but maybe if we get that person through training to get a credential in one year, you know, that could lift them up. Um, and we would save two years of childcare subsidies by investing in that credential if we did it the right way. Um, and so I think that's how I would prioritize. The other way that I would prioritize would be that we, uh, I would say that Workforce Solutions is open. I want, we want to hear what the others think the priority is, and I think that whatever that consensus is, then I think that that's the direction. That we that we would go. That would be the priority. I, I just want to say this is a hard question. <laughs> it's just because there's so many priorities, but I think that's why it's an important question because we all have our individual priorities, and, and trying to find what is is a priority and shared priorities is always difficult. I agree with uh, Gavin in, in that uh, it should be whatever has the largest impact. Um, you know, in, in our case, and I think that. There's so many priorities, and so it's difficult to say which one we would focus on. But I think diversion and prevention of homelessness, because homelessness um, really, uh, in turn, affects everybody in this room. It affects every every corner of the city and, and the county. And so, um, if we can focus on diverting people and preventing people from becoming homeless and, and doing that, but again, I don't think I can I answer that question because it's not narrow enough, right? I was just thinking about how we've done this before. Um, in 2016, uh, there was a focus in the city to end better homelessness, and um, everybody, you know, rallied on it, and, and it happened. And, and you know, they were still making sure that better, better homelessness. Um, you know, once we identify that they're in uh, that's homeless, they their house within a specific amount of days, and, and so on and so forth, because the entire community rallied on on what that one priority was. So whatever the priority does come out of this conversation or any other conversation, I think the important part is that the whole community rallies on it. And then and then once it is obtained, the goal is obtained, then um, continue to uh, work towards making sure it, it, it stays the way it's, it was meant to be. And, and um, with that said, it's not going to be any better homeless to be done as what's next. And, and really coming as a community to identify what that is and supporting that idea. And that way we can move on to the next one and then the next one and then the next one. But unless we do that, we're just going to have a bunch of goals, everybody individually, and nothing's really going to get accomplished. Um, and I, I think that's a, a great point, and, and collaboration is essential. And I'm uh, kind of on the same page as Ricardo as far as starting early and aligning, you know, really the how for me is aligning systems and so you have an education system, government system, faith-based systems, social services systems, health systems. How do we align those systems um, to focus on children's health and children's well-being so that the zip code they're born in doesn't limit them, um, limit the opportunities they have for success because right now it does. Um, the zip code you're born in determines a lot about how your how your outcome, how your future will end up. And we need to change that. And you know, I think an example as far as aligning systems is you know, we have school gets out at three o'clock.
and then we wrap childcare around it so that parents can work, or kids don't have childcare and they go home and, um, you know, without without any adult influence at home. And so, how do we align things so that people can work? We, you know, not most families don't have the luxury anymore of so a mom that stays home like they did in the '50s, and so you know we need to adjust to that. And, and even the services we provide, you know, we do that until 4:30 or 5 o'clock when people are working. And so, how do we change what we're doing and align to focus on the client? So I think that's the how, and for me, the, the prioritization would be focusing on um, children young, even even before they're born, so the mothers are healthy, the children have all the preventative care and immunizations, and that all of these systems are coming together to build resilience and provide um, you know, the, the opportunities that the children need. So I know we were guided you know, not to prepare, for the, for the session, but I'm a preparer by nature, so as I was kind of sketching out my, my thoughts, this question was extremely difficult for me, and it still sits blank on my paper. And I am the, the pragmatic problem solver mixed with the, the dreamer and the innovator, so usually questions like this are very you know straightforward and simple and easy and natural for me to answer. This is difficult because it's, it's such a large question, it's such a large undertaking. This talks about where do we begin that work. So we talk about you know coordinated care and you know collaborating and partnering, but what does that look like? And so I agree with Melody that it's about taking stock of the current systems in place, the current structures in place, and figuring out how we bring those together uh, to be a comprehensive set of services, a comprehensive set of supports for our community members. And as I shared earlier, I think there's some phenomenal structures that are already in existence and some that are emerging and we need to get behind those and rally behind those because those structures, those systems, those are going to be changers for our community and helping our community members you know, access a better life for themselves and for their families. Um, because I know you know speaking of zip codes, we, we take a look at for our students in particular I'm, I'm in Palo Alto College, but for our students we look at for Harlandale ISD educational attainment rates for those particular zip codes. They have changed and they've gotten better and they've moved out of that space and kind of the lower spectrum where Harlandale didn't want to be because of programs like Early College High School, because of TRIO, um, because of you know communities and schools and all these partner agencies coming together. And so it's possible and we've seen it and we've seen it happen quickly. But how do we, what do those conversations look like in terms of aligning the systems and bringing everybody together? That's, that's difficult because that's where, that's where, that's where it begins. So my answer is, I don't have the best answer. I'm still struggling with it. So I, I mean, I'm still pondering this stuff that they put out there that imagination was the best nation in the world for a nonprofit guys. Donation is the best. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think, we, I mean, it, it, it's so hard because you see the, the need to prioritize, the need to get narrow and focus. At the same time, many of our organizations are, are getting out of the lane and out of the box and, um, you know, hopefully staying on a superhighway where there's multiple lanes, at least headed in the right direction. Um, but I, so I... I would just say I think we we have to get to a place where poverty is unacceptable. And if poverty is unacceptable, then you know what is the strategy um, to defend that, right? And I think uh, as a huge Spurs fan, you know we've got to move from some defense to one on one, and 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 that's the coordinated care. That's the coordination of once we go to the one-on-one -on -one defense, each one of us have a role to play. And it's, it's in playing that role and, and, and defending that family against poverty that, that, that I think we can move collectively in a strategy um, with technology anchoring um, 
the accountability um, and the transparency of outcomes to help us um, test and prove and, and uh, eliminate ineffective um, maybe technique. But uh, it, it's, it, you know, now's the time. I mean, this is our community and, and we're the ones. So we, we uh, have, you know, we've been, we've been all prepared for this moment in time where we can say, Just really quickly, um, well, to your point about donations, the, I, I'm the type of person that loves to address the other things in the room a lot of the time. And donations is, is you know, it's just a, a, a real good example of limited resources. And so it's hard to choose a priority for everyone because we have limited resources and we want our priority to be the priority that, that, that's picked, right? Um, but I think that that also brings up a great point about so oftentimes having to put your priority on the side burner to get to that one priority that has the most impact. Um, and you know, the side burner is, doesn't necessarily it's coming off, it doesn't necessarily mean it's coming off the stove, but doing that is a, a lot harder uh, said than done because you have your ego, you have your goals, and you we are who we are, and just saying, well, let's focus on this because it's going to have a better impact and it's going to impact everything else, it's hard to do. So I think having those conversations those, uh, about the elephants in the room and the fact that there's limited resources is also critical. And then to your point um, on, on um, not being able to answer the question, I don't think we were necessarily supposed to answer the question. I think that this is why this is beautiful. It's because um, we're having the conversation. Any other comments? By the way, Eric, it's pronounced do. <laughs> and the nation remains the imagination. nation. <laughs> so you give those funds because you yeah, part of that nation. Okay, okay not that. <laughs> um, so um, the things that I heard is that now is the time. Let's lean into it and how technology can bring us accountability and transparency within that. Uh, moving from the zone to one on one. A place where poverty is unacceptable. Um, taking stock of those systems that are in existence and emerging, uh, and aligning those systems, uh, focus on children even before birth, um, so that zip code doesn't hold back those opportunities. Something that the whole community rallies around, um, and even in one sense, kind of getting over ourselves and moving forward then as a collective uh, and to work together in priority. And it's interesting too that you started with child care affordable and bringing to the table partnerships with those who have the closest contact. So um, we're going to move into our last round. But while you were having the conversation of this last question and priorities, these folks are going to take everything that they just talked about and they're going to come up with one statement. They're going to prioritize what they have talked about and what might hold the greatest potential. Not all four steps, or 10 steps, or 20 steps, that greatest potential. And I will tell you when there's still about five minutes left, so whoever you're talking with, you, I'm inviting you to do the same thing. You will take everything that you've heard among yourselves and you will come up with one statement that has the greatest potential. Does that make sense? Okay, and then we're going to hear all of this. All right, so final question. Being as innovative as possible, how do we move forward to make this happen? What action would you prioritize as one? All right, let's come back into the conversation. We have exactly 15 minutes. There are 15 conversation circles, which also includes this one right here. So that means each circle has one minute, and I have a timer, so that will help you as well. So since these are our conversation starters and our leaders and our models, Catherine's going to stand up and tell us what they're going to do in a minute or less. <laughs> 
Hello. For those of you who are looking into the back of my head the entire time, this is what my face looks like. So thank you all for the opportunity to share and engage this morning. We enjoy this question, but also struggle with it. It's a difficult one. We came up with a statement in the first focus area. So our statement is, lean into the discomfort and no longer accept poverty. And our first focus area is on families. So including you know, mothers, fathers, children, youth, uh, grandparents, and, and focusing on that particular area as opposed to that. And what are you going to do when you leave this room to make that happen? I have you here in the house. Anybody, anybody has 10 seconds left for your team? They're going to think about that very intentionally. What action are you going to take, Ricardo? Okay, be intentional, but I am, I am going to be calling you. Right? Okay, I can't make this up. All right, uh, so Rosalind and Mario are going to be microphones with feet on them. So we have two microphones here. And who's, what table is going to be willing to go next? There's one over here. Uh, okay, so we just want, we were talking about prioritizing people and not numbers. And kind of just an observation we made was that we have a lot of awesome organizations out here. But I think next time we have an event like this, it would be really great if each organization brought a client and really help the community to build the successes. That's a great step. Always bring someone to receive the service you're receiving with you. All right. Okay, so um, what we came up with was having intentional partnerships. So going out and really making a connection with another organization with the goal of in the next year making another partnership so that we have these real intentional partnerships. Also ongoing education and having organizations educated about the issues of what's going on in our communities. That's it. So we've got bringing somebody intentionally with you, forming another partnership within the next year. And what was the last part? I just, I'm going to education. Thank you. Another. Going over here. A for O. I think one of the things that is, is real important is, is ed education is a key, but it's not just literacy, but it's educating our community about what poverty really is, what mental illness is, what life skills are needed as well as what this, the effect of trauma had on the lives of individuals. To increase a citywide compassion, we've got to be able to have this uh, the citywide compassion for uh, all of the residents in our center. So, Garrett, when you go back to Haven, are you going to intentionally share what you just said with the leadership there to help move that forward? One of our key values is to learn what trauma informed is about. We are in the process of educating our staff about mental uh, illness and about trauma. So, and, and certainly all of our partners at Haven are part of teaching the life skills and how to uh, for a person to better improve themselves and be able to have to live in this world and understand. But compassion is our so going back to where we serve, uh, being intentional about education, forming another partnership, and taking those that are being served along, and focusing then on the elimination of poverty. Who else? One over here. So we did determine that the priority is um, more towards what the problem is. So for some of us, it might be homelessness. Some of us might be food insecurity. So what we would like to prioritize is creating that network of resources. So if I have a client that at the time they are homeless, I can, like, I can go to Clarissa and say, hey, do you have room for this family? Or I might go with City Church and ask them, hey, what resources might you have? Or maybe they can come. 
instead of continuing the same conversation outside of the space and intentionally working on that resource pool as well. So did you all know each other before? No. no. So you're going to continue that conversation among yourselves? Great. And over here? Hi, uh, my name is Martha Garcia. I'm with the Health Collaborative. And the conversation over here went directly to Promotora. I've been a Promotora for over 20 years. And we already uh, are trying to close that gap between the agencies and the families. Uh, and we have to do it more intentionally. We address all the system issues that don't match with the family needs. And I think that Promotoras can have a greater impact on all this. And one of the conversations that started two years ago for us is poverty. We don't want to. We want to attack poverty. It was a very uh, scary subject, but we need to address it because that's what we see every day. And we need to take care of ourselves because we don't want to burn out. But promotoras are very essential, and San Antonio has a great uh, program with the Health Collaborative and with the trainers. And what I'm going to do when I get back, and we all agree that we're going to inform others of what happened here. I'm going to inform all the health promoters from Bear County that we have, and we're going to talk about the conversation here and how we can get more, um, we can share more our stories and what we're doing. But um, this is something that we've been talking about for a while, so I'm glad that y'all got it. It's because of what we see with the back here. Thank you. Great. Another? Everybody's going to have the opportunity to go. The big word for us was community because we all experience the sense of you in your silo and I'm in my silo and where do we interact, which was a big part of this coming together this morning. So if our ultimate goal is communities becoming a singular community of understanding, connectedness, and compassion, then we would see a first step in that is removing the stigma of poverty. Because as it was said, to make poverty unacceptable, we have to be able to understand that impoverished people are fully acceptable and full members of our community. Thank you. Someone else? Okay, so what we uh, we went along the same lines as um, what you stated that an individual may have homelessness, but it may not be what their main concern is. They may have mental health issues. They may have other healthcare issues, and it could be external or internal issues. Um, so our our statement is conduct an internal and external individual root cause analysis in order to align those systems. Because without that data and information, you're not going to be able to make your decisions on to how to uh, distribute your funds that you receive if you get donations. What are you going to do with that? Um, so the focus area is data to drive your decisions with intention and purpose. So I heard in that, and I think it connects too with what Mel said earlier, but you were talking about an internal assessment and Mel was mentioning across the systems, which that internal process then connected to all the different systems would be an amazing step, right? All right. Someone else here? So what we took away um, from all three questions today was tackling poverty, um, addressing that First, um, albeit through means of legislation and policy, right, if we're talking about sustainable wages. And the way, the action that we thought about as well um, is collaboration. And I am with St. Mary's Law, and we do ID recovery at Labor for Hope. And so I'm sitting with um, fellow nonprofit CAM Ministries, they also do ID recovery. So that's really the first step in, um, in tackling the cycle of, of ending poverty is obtaining a job. How do you obtain a job? Get your ID. 
um, a lot of them can't get IDs because of warrants. So what we have discussed in taking action is a collaboration with a number of partners to see how we can all work together to address that issue. And did you find that list of partners? You don't have to share that, but have you made some definition? Oh, we there? have. And we've actually been working with others. We had SAPD come to you and promote and just witness what we do and kind of try and um, collaborate based on that. Uh, but we have SAPD, St. Mary's, Sorella's, uh, sister, oh, I'm sorry, faith based churches and here. Um, just one more. If there is anyone that is interested in coming to this meeting in reference to IV, please let us know. See, the next step is happening. Yes, yes, back here. That mic's not working. Our conversation was a little more basic um, about. Um, fact that we're all human beings and we have the habit of speaking in terms of they, them, those, um, so that way we're not connected with them, but we are all connected. And, and so uh, it had to do with the conversation of changing the wording and how we speak to each other. Speak to those folks that have mental issues or are homeless or dealing with poverty, that we're all connected, we're all created uh, by God as human beings and we need to do it that way. So changing the conversation from not, hey, that guy on the street over there, you know, that guy is someone's son, um, brother, husband, uh, whatever. Give them the name. It's a language in the importance of it. Thank you. Who else? Some of those topics are already been touched on before, but uh, looking at you know, adverse childhood experiences for uh, our early children, School districts, the majority of our ISDs have uh, trainers and specialists that are looking into this area for trauma and more trauma sensitive campuses, and also ensuring that we have processes in place to uh, capture those kids and make sure that they're not exited from the school district too quickly. And they're also captured by other organizations that support them outside the school. And so, uh, looking at early childhood experience, understanding what ACE scores look like, understanding what long-term effects of those are, and how you know, individuals end up in homelessness because of those. So looking at the causes and what's behind all of it. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Monica Silva. I am the Director of Programs and Partnerships at Communities and Schools here in San Antonio. And one of the conversations that we had um, was really focusing um, on families, even though we see a lot of subpopulations and we see individuals out there as well. But in the realm that we work in, the space that we work with, we see students and families and, uh, coming to us. So building relationships to educate. So a lot of times people will not take um, the information we give them unless we are actually genuine and we build those relationships um, and understand where they're coming from. So like what Tyler was saying in terms of trauma, and understanding that particular aspect of things will actually enrich the relationship you actually will have with that individual to get them a step further. And so doing that would also be through that educational piece of developing the resources like a lot of folks have indicated. And San Antonio, I think, is doing a really good job with the directory that they have established. And I think that's one step, even though we've had several resources within the community over the years, I don't think the conversation has come together as of yet of how we can connect all of those, such as through United Way, through necessities, those kinds of things. So educating ourselves to educate others, I think is one of the main pieces that we need to really work on here. Educational relationships. Who are we missing? Someone over here, one here. Maybe it's not. Right. We're focused on accessibility and what collaboration can do for accessibility and resources in the community. Uh, like coming together, like the biggest hindrance to resources and access is complexity. One of our group members also applied to San Antonio Company where you can call in and get qualified for those resources all in one place and learn about what is available to you and that uh, bringing um, organizations together 
provide all of those resources in one place rather than finding out that you need something and then you have to go somewhere else to get it or you know, being left out entirely. Thank you. Next. I saw a hand over here and I know that table hasn't gone yet. Sorry.